Hey everyone, welcome to the Open Source Founder Podcast. Joining me today is Daniel, core maintainer of Nuxt. Daniel, thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I would love to start with some information about your personal background, all the way to your involvement with Nuxt. It is, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Okay. Uh, personal background, I've, I've got a lot of different things in my background, uh, to be honest. Uh, so let's see. I'm American uh, originally. I uh, I grew up uh, just outside of Washington DC before I came to the UK to go to university where I studied law um, and uh, loved that. So I was really, really into to law, uh, particularly I think I, I liked arguing, so debating and, and that kind of thing. And so that suited me very well. Uh, then I uh, worked for a church for a year and then I went back to, to uh, university to study theology for a few years. And then I led a church for uh, five, five years uh, up in the northeast of England before I started a creative agency uh, with uh, my wife and father, uh, focusing on clear written communication. We then added more and more technical stuff to what we did. And I then pivoted into software as a service and, uh, and got more and more involved in contributing back to Nuxt, which was the framework we used at the time. Uh, and then when, when I uh, ended up shutting down the, the SaaS startup, uh, I was just asked to uh, focus full-time on maintaining Nuxt. And I've done that ever since. So it's uh, been a bit of a weird, a weird journey, but I certainly love, lo- loved every step of the way. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's an incredible background, actually, and very unique. Uh, what is it that drew you to this career change or a few of them? I mean, you said you studied law, right? So what made you decide to sort of like leave um, that field? Well, it, in, in none of those cases was it a d- decision to leave so much as it mm-hmm. was uh, something that, uh, that I wanted to do. Um, so for example, uh, law, I, I, I know I would have loved it. I loved, loved the university and I loved uh, what I was, was doing in terms of um, moot court and things like that, and uh, practice. But um, but I th- but that particular decision was more about me thinking that my uh, that I was being more motivated, I think, by what other people would think of me than by what I would actually enjoy most and be best at doing. So, in terms of uh, leading a church, church leader versus uh, being a lawyer. Um, I felt, well, actually, I wonder if I'm, I'm making that decision just based on what I think I'd be better at um, doing and doing well, or whether actually I was, I was letting other people's views of me influence that. So it was when I came to that conclusion that I, I then went to study uh, theology uh, and to think a little bit different about my, about my life. So that was, I think, a really healthy thing. Uh, later on, um, when I pivoted <laughs> again, from, uh, from <laughs> church work uh, to starting the creative agency, the main motivation was to help my parents come to the UK. So mm-hmm. as Americans, they couldn't just uh, move here. Um, so we decided to start a company and uh, um, build a creative agency. Uh, that would then give them the right to come to the UK. We could work together on it um, and hopefully build something that would, would last and be, be valuable. Uh, and it, it was indeed, it's still, still running. The original team have still have kept going, which is a delight to see. Um, but again, that was the reason. Um, I, every time you change, like something big like that, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you've experienced something similar, but definitely for me, there's a, a sense of mourning. So you mourn what you had before. You also, there's also, you know, what do people think of you? So, you know, do, are, you, are you a failure uh, in terms of, a failure at the thing that you were doing previously. Now you've switched to something else. Did you fail? Was that like, how much of that do you take on personally? So I, I think there, there are a lot of things to, um, it's not just as difficult. It, like it's, it's more difficult than just pivoting. It's not just, oh, I used to do this and now I do this and there's some new challenges. It's also, what do I think of myself? How do mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. other people think about me? How do I come to terms with that? Um, do I feel like part of my life up to now has been a waste of time? Do I feel like, 
do, do you know, there's lots and lots of, of questions uh, along those lines, which are, are tricky. Um, so. Well, I, I feel like we'd have an hour long podcast just discussing exactly. Five these minutes things. in yeah. and we're talking about <laughs> yeah, sort of exactly deep, like, deep questions of, of uh, that was sort of full identity. Sign. Oh my God. Value. And, and, and as you said, I guess it, it relates to how much your identity has been ingrained with the things you mm -hmm. do. And, uh, that is, that is crazy. I, I hope we can dig in just a little deeper. I mean, is there any, maybe just taking a step back, making it a little more, uh, lighthearted, um, are there skills, um, that you built along the way while in law, while doing theology, uh, that have been, you know, transferred to, how you manage the community today within open source or lessons that you carried over maybe. So, I mean, absolutely. I do think that there are, there are skills and things that are relevant sort of across, um, those different career paths. So, uh, I mean, so yes, that's one of the things that you, you spotted there that, that, um, in, in church life, a lot of what the, the life, I mean, a, a church isn't an institution. A church is a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, exactly. and uh, and so when you're thinking about what a church does, it's not that someone says this is what we do, and you know, it's not like that. It's an it's a body. It's an organic uh, thing, a group of people who um, work together, and um, and I think there's a similarity to open source work in that open source work isn't it doesn't work on a company basis it's not that there's someone who is in charge and just says this is what we do uh, leadership is important in both of them so it's i'm not saying that everything just sort of happens without any but it's not as it's not about um just telling people what to do like th there is it's a much more complex more organic thing where things like trust and um and value and um appreciation and regard like there are a lot of things involved um that are that are i think and so yes there are absolutely parallels and i think in particular that organic nature um i also personally feel that um so my mm -hmm. view of open source is very much that it is about mutual gift so mm -hmm. main t i give and i also receive other gifts from people so um those gifts look like a lots lots of different things so uh, other people give to the, I mean, I felt this from the day I was um, contributing to Nuxt, uh, you know, building my SaaS my startup, you know, I'm g giving back uh, bug fixes and features and other people are also giving in bug fixes and features and we all benefit, you know, there, there's no, it's not a contractual relationship. It's not a, um, we're not sort of, well, I'll contribute if you contribute, you know, it's, it's just gift. Um, and I, I certainly feel that as a maintainer as well, you know, I give time, I, I help people. I, there's no condition on that. I don't do that because people, um, sponsor me or because that I, I do that because I want to help people. And at the same time, people sponsor me and they don't sponsor me because I am, um, like it was an arrangement, you know, I'll mm -hmm. sponsor you if you do this. I don't have any sponsorships that are conditional. Um, and, and yet it worked. Now, I mean, I guess this is actually goes quite, quite to the sort of Algora uh, question and concept. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, that is something I felt for a while, like freely you received, freely give. And that, that is, which is actually, um, uh, uh, actually a, a quote from, uh, or quoted in the New Testament as being something that Jesus said. Uh, but it is certainly how I feel about open source, um, like the freely, the free receiving. And the free giving, um, and and for me that's that's a very significant motivation for why I'm involved in open source. That sort of mutual giving, which I, um, which is, I really I really love. I'm not gonna lie, I feel very inspired uh, listening to you <laughs> speak, and I kind of want to let you just go on and on, and and, and then you know maybe do a playback while I'm going to bed, you know, or meditating. <laughs> I. Thanks so much for for sharing this. And is it are all these things that you usually talk about, or that your community you know asks you about? Do you or do you sort of like try to not really make these things public about your background, or they they manifest in your everyday life and your community? Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't 
don't think I, I sort of keep anything. Uh, I know I, I talk, maybe you talk about them a, a bit. I guess often probably it doesn't come up. Um, but it's I think I think initially I probably did chose not to talk about my mm -hmm. different background, if only because I wanted to be taken secret seriously as a developer. And sometimes I think you can feel like particularly when you only have, you know, I learned Vue by uh, sort of uh, Lara Cast's sort of free course on Vue. Um, and, and, you know, you think you don't necessarily like, you, I, I don't know, you feel a little bit embarrassed um, if you're not coming from a background of, of huge experience, but you're talking to people who have a huge amount of experience. So definitely it's um, the um, imposter syndrome that I think a lot of us experience tells us, oh, you better not let on you better not say like you, you you should probably focus on uh just the just the technical details don't no need to to bring up any anything but uh i'm definitely much more comfortable talking about it now um and in fact i would want to talk about it um mm -hmm. to represent um other people who are who might also have a less common background in terms of coming into open source although i say that is less common i'm not sure it is i think a lot of people have got got different different backgrounds and it is lovely to see that because I, I think every different background brings different sets of skills and life experience and i mean that's part of how you have a, a, a healthy community is if you have people with different um, capabilities and backgrounds and gifts and if things are too like homogenous or monochrome then you you, you really lose out you know, sort of not just from a community spirit point of view but also like what you're producing with a project doesn't doesn't have the same life and and uh direction to it i really appreciate that uh having this conversation so far and uh you know i i as much as i want to continue digging into these topics I'd, I'd love to transition and ask you a little bit about your everyday life today uh running nox what it looks like what are some things maybe that people can anticipate what's on the roadmap yeah well right now it's an interesting time because we are about a year since I started uh, leading the project. And one of the things that I wanted to do uh, early on was to commit to firm uh, roadmap and release schedule. Um, so we, we said that we would have a, a, minor, a patch release pretty much every week, give or take, uh, a minor release every month, give or take, and a major release uh, every year, give or take. Which means we're coming up to Nuxt four as a release, and so um, a lot of what we're what we're talking about uh, as a team and um, thinking about is what are the deliberate um, API changes that we're going to make for Nuxt four, uh, because uh, we, we we don't we don't want those to be big and we don't want those to be difficult to migrate to. So we want to provide all the tools that somebody will need, and um, whether that's code uh, code mods to help or tools to guide people or even just options to opt into a previous behavior. Um, we want that to be a very seamless process. But still, these are API decisions and design decisions. So what are the, our deliberate, deliberate breakages? Bearing in mind, we basically get a chance to do that about once a year if we stick with the original plan. Um, so that's a lot of what my focus is on right now. Um, most of the cool features that you might think um, of in association with Nux don't need a major release. Because cool features mm -hmm. are enhancements, so those are minors. That that's that we've hope, hopefully been shipping pretty consistently over the last year. And if we hadn't been doing it every month, we'd probably you know, have bigger minors. Though I think our minors are not bad. But yes, we do we do have um, some nice features planned. But a lot of what I'm focusing right, on right now is that, that major release coming. Up. What would um, you say is your biggest challenge? Um running Nux then and the community which sometimes might have you know conflicting sort of like interests or trying to pull the project towards one direction or the other um what, what's the biggest challenge in maintaining Nux? so i think um a big challenge is uh is context so mm -hmm. for example Nux has so many inter interweaving parts so there's uh even just the different packages in the monorepo from the cli to um, how we test things, to our integration with Vite, to our integration with Nitro, the server uh, component of Nux. 
um, to uh, the sort of our, our plugins that integrate with Rollup and more. And then obviously there's a whole sub ecosystem. We split out a lot of the utilities we use in Nuxt into a, a GitHub organization called Andreas. And those, um, will, those, those exist and are used by Nuxt quite deeply. So um, figuring out this behavior is happening, let's just say it's a bug. Where is it coming from? Um, you know, it might be that uh, it's really a, an upstream library quite far. It might be that it's somewhere in the repo. And, and so the, the biggest issue is, is, is making sure that, that when triaging or, or looking at an issue, you're able to place that in its context even before it can be resolved. Um, and there are obviously a huge volume of issues and um, requests for help coming through. Um, and so basically handling, I think that's the, that's the most, bottleneck, uh, most bottleneck part of, of the Nux community. A lot of other things are working quite well. Um, but yeah, finding, finding people who, who know the context, that's, that's, that's a very difficult thing. Um, it feels to me like there's a lot of, a lot of movement, a lot of uh, sort of dynamism, and very little pulling in opposite directions in Nux. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things we offer, we have choices. So you can opt into one behavior or another. Um, and we, we experiment with those a bit. And if you, do, if you want your own different behavior, there's nothing to stop you from building that yourself because it's quite extensible, which means that it's not so final. So if you say, oh, we don't think this behavior should be built in um, from a vision roadmap point of view, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, people are, are um, unable to proceed. They can still use the behavior they want. Which is which is nice, um, but yes, obviously, where you have to make a decision, even if it's as simple as what side of the road you drive on, you know, it's not doesn't matter. And that, but just but making and the decision, decision making. Does. Do you feel like? Pardon me. Do you feel like it? It rests a lot, you know, upon your shoulders. Is there a more communal sort of like decision making process uh, what does it look like in practice for such a big project i don't think it's it's just on me to make make decisions so i i mean it it could be um but i think my my point of view is so i have the responsibility to make the decision but when you have such a talented team um as uh, sebastian who wrote it in the first place or Puya or um Anthony or Alex or Lucy or Harlan or Julian or whoever, why wouldn't you get that, that viewpoint? And, and I'm very happy to change my, my opinion. Um, so it often ends up being more collaborative. Um, if people have strong opinions, then obviously we try and resolve those first. Um, at the end of the day, it's I, I'll make the call, but that's not because my opinion's right <laughs> by any means. For people who are not you know, uh, too familiar with the community, the project, or the ecosystem, you know, surrounding it, the ecosystem that Nux has created. Um, is there some information you could share with us, sort of like big picture about uh, what it's looking like today? About the community? About the community, the ecosystem, the, you know, the traction of it, the size, the organizations involved. Um, yeah. So, um, well, and I guess I should probably say what Nux does. Um, it's a framework for building web applications um, with Vue.js as the front-end library uh, and built on Nitro as the serverless framework that uh, governs the back-end. Um, it has a real focus on developer experience and also extensibility. So you shouldn't need to, to make any um, changes. So best practices should be built in, but you should be able to change almost every part of it. And this was really part of Nuxt from the very beginning. And that is, I think, what has helped make the community. Because, uh, so we have this concept of, of a package um, uh, called, called a Nuxt module. So uh, a function, effectively, that can hook into different parts of Nuxt's build uh, process and even add runtime code or, uh, or change behaviors or defaults or whatever. And that is incredibly powerful. So Nitro, for example, was originally implemented as a module for Nux. Um, and I think almost everything you could do, you 
you could do with the module. So that means that people can build their own integrations. We have a, um, a directory on GitHub, which is just uh, full of, just has YAML files. That is a sort of index to all the Nuxt modules um, that, that want to be added to it. And that's also on Nuxt.com as well. You can browse Nuxt.com forward slash modules and see some of what there, what there is. So third parties like CMSs or deployment providers or error tracking or authentication or whatever can, can build their own integration. And uh, or, or people who have good ideas can also do the same. Um, and often even features that ultimately are added to Nuxt at the core level start out as a module so people can mm -hmm. test it and, and see. So that has, I think, made a huge difference to Nuxt and to the Nuxt community because people can when you think about Nuxt and its its evolution and growth, I think you really the the community are a very significant part of that. Without people building modules and pushing forward, Nuxt wouldn't be pushing forward. You know, we're not we're not a company or enterprise driven project uh, like some of the other um, frameworks that are out there. We are very much a community driven project. Um, and so. Yeah, so the community, I think, is very healthy. We have um, lots and lots of, um, of modules. I was, uh, and a lot of people are using Nux. I don't know really if I should, um, should share this, but just today, um, we uh, hit an all-time high in terms of um, projects and sessions uh, using Nux. So we, we have anonymous uh, opt-in telemetry. Mm -hmm. um, which just tells us that it was a, a, a session, a dev session started with Nux. And so today we had over uh, 10,400 uh, projects um, using Nux, the oh. dev command was started. So that's pretty cool. I was, uh, I was really excited to see that. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's healthy. Um, there, there are a good number of folks using it. Exactly, and, and you know, I'm wishing you a lot more growth for the community and the project uh, moving forward. That's that's incredible. And you just mentioned about the fact that you know there's not an enterprise behind Nox. It's it's just a community, and I guess that that brings us to a, a next conversation topic, which is about the sustainability of the community and the organization. Uh, you know, a lot. A lot of open source projects today are going towards the commercial direction, creating companies behind, getting funding uh, so that they can also use to, uh, so that people can work full time on the project. Uh, you mentioned earlier how a lot of people are sponsoring you. Uh, not, not a unique concept in open source, but definitely prevalent. Uh, and so how, how is all this looking like today? Um, how have you experienced it personally being at the helm? And what what could other people learn from this, and maybe what what challenges are also inherent with this uh, format? Well, I am maybe not the the most um, representative example because I'm not only sponsored by um, individuals, but I'm also sponsored most notably by Nuxt Labs, which is mm -hmm. a company that was. Uh, created by the same people who created Nuxt, so uh, Sebastian Chopin and his brother. Uh, and they, uh, they provide a whole raft of services. So they fund a number of Nuxt developers across the ecosystem, uh, like me, uh, like Anthony Fu uh, and Booyah. Um, and they provide services like consultancy, and they have some software as a service products as well. So um, there's uh, Nuxt UI Pro, there's Nuxt Studio and so on. Um, and that was basically created in order to try and, and uh, fund open source so that, that the purpose of it was the funding of open source. And I'll tell you, you know, um, I really, really respect how Sebastian has done that and how open source doesn't take a second seat in terms of his, his vision. So it doesn't influence the, the direction of the framework, for example. Um, to serve the needs of Nux Labs, it's sort of the other way around. Um, it's uh, and and I should say I am uh, I'm able to spend most of my time working on on uh, on on Nux. I'm a, pretty much a full time maintainer. Um, the and I but I think that is that is totally unusual uh, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times 
it does take this sort of, it takes either popularity, so seeing a project become incredibly well known, just so that there are so many people who might uh, might donate or sponsor the project, um, or it takes a company or something that is driving adoption or sponsorship or revenue in some way to make it possible. So you look at you know Tailwind CSS for example, which is a phenomenally hugely used open source project, and it's basically funded through uh, Tailwind UI um, and some of the other project uh, products that they put out. Um, or you look at Next.js, which is uh, funded, as far as I'm aware, primarily through Vassal, um, the company. And, you know, there are, there are other others out there. And I'm not sure you, that's, that, that's, that's, that's entirely no, great. No, that, of course, uh, you, you mentioned Nux Labs already um, and, and, and how they're supporting, of course, the open source project and its, its priority. Uh, have you personally uh, taken up any consulting work or, you know, uh, has this been part of yes. your works for so um so i do i do i do um consult as well with with uh, with companies and individuals too um i'm i'm sort of i'm a bit limited in terms of time uh, because leading leading the next team is, is probably is quite a, a significant uh, thing but i do really value consultancy and doing things outside of the the core if only because, and I would say this to anyone building a, uh, an open source project, that actually seeing how people use it and um, mm -hmm. building things with it, which is another reason why I try and build stuff with Nux, really changes how you interact with it. So uh, you see the need or the bad DX decision or what, what needs to, to be fixed uh, much more clearly when you're actually using it on a day-to-day -day basis than if you're just focusing on building the project. Um, so it's, yeah, so I, 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 I often put out like tiny, tiny projects. They're not, not huge, but it is, it is really useful to see. And the amount of time I've spent, for example, on my own blog totally outweighs mm -hmm. the importance of the blog. I mean, my website isn't that important, but you know, I, I try every edge uh, case scenario and, uh, and so on. And it's, it's really nice to have something where you can tinker and just try and, and focus on solving some issue or figuring out some need and you know it's it's when you're you're micro optimizing we all micro optimize don't we when you when you push something far enough you you micro optimize at the end um, and actually be able to take those micro optimizations and bring them back into the core of nux as well it's quite a quite a good thing quite a good thing for people that's that's sweet so it's, it sounds like a lot of times some you know some implementation something new that was built custom maybe for for a customer in a consulting uh, format makes its way um, into the, the core project uh, sometimes. Um, yeah, so some... I think, um, for example, I was able to use my website uh, to do a lot of debugging with um, Nux server components and figuring out mm -hmm. how you would want to use them and how, what, what the most, uh, what the best way of, the, the best kind of API from a user point of view, what, what is it like to use them? Um, that's certainly been the case. Um, I mean, the vast majority of my time is is actually just triaging issues and fixing bugs and building features in Nux. But but yes, absolutely, stuff stuff does filter in from testing things out elsewhere. And and it's definitely a privilege for organizations to you know have you and collaborate with you on on these um, that is, on these kind that of, nice uh, custom projects. No, absolutely. Um, I just just one last. Follow up question here, uh, because for a lot of open source maintainers who um, there's no commercial entity behind their project, uh, they're working on this on, on their own free time. Uh, do you recommend this sort of format for people who would like to work more full time on their project and make it you know sustainable for themselves and their community to take up this, uh, take consulting work with with uh, say, an agency or, or a startup that is using uh, their technology, uh, is there any, any word of caution or something that is maybe, uh, you know, a problem that people should keep in mind uh, compared to not the many other options? Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, this format, what, what more could we say about it? So, I mean, I, I think consultancy can, can work very well. Um, so when I did more consultancy, I was... Uh, Paid much, much better, for example. 
So I'm, I, uh, from a purely financial point of view, it can work very well to be, to be doing consultancy as opposed to full-time open source. Um, and I think it could be quite a, a good bootstrapping opportunity if you start out that way. But I think a lot of the, the things about consultant, there are a lot of things, for example, that I don't like about consultants. So mm -hmm. um, consultancy is a very specific, it can be very specifically about your time, um, which means that, um, so I, I'm very people orientated. So I hate billing people. I don't like asking much of them. I like to do things as fast as I can. And so that means that, that I might have like five minutes of billable time. And that is very frustrating because you contact switch, you fix the problem, and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, you build five minutes. It, it, the whole thing is it, not necessarily a great, great experience. Um, you also have the whole, you basically, if you're a consultant, consulting you uh, and you don't have a platform um, to somehow get people to ask you to do things, you have to do marketing and you have, to, obviously you have to do all of your bookkeeping and your accounting and your invoice creation, obviously a time track. There's a whole business that you need to, to implement, which is really tricky, um, you know. And some people are great at that and love it and focusing on like the bones infrastructure. I mean, I've got to say, I have invoices I probably should send out. I have, in fact, an invoice I probably should have sent out several months ago. I, I just, I hate doing it. I really hate doing it. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably a, not a, a very successful freelancer. Um, in lots of ways, but um, so I don't know. It depends um, on who you are, maybe. Thank you for the perspective. Do you think um, a part of this? I mean, the, the the need from businesses is is recurring and big, and there's only so many people like yourself. But there's certainly a lot of experts in the community. Do you think uh, eventually some members of the community, some next experts, could take up some of these? Uh, um, some of these projects, some of these, you know, contracts, could there be a sort of like quote unquote, you know, little internal marketplace of some sort? Is that something you ever considered uh, or you think it's like a bad idea, if that made sense? For like next uh, consultants, uh, for people to find them and, and recruit them. I, mm -hmm. think, I think if there's a way to do that, where it is, so, I guess it's a lot of it is about is about trust. So you know, if you're if you're hiring someone, and I've absolutely been on the side of, of of things, obviously hiring people to do to do work, it's very difficult to figure out if they know what they're talking about. Um, and even if they do know, how reliable are they? How you know on a day to day basis? How efficient are they at working? Can you leave something with them? Do they need to be managed? Sort of. And and ideally, a consultant doesn't need to be micromanaged, you give them an objective, you set parameters, and that happens, right? There's, there's no, no need to uh, check up, check in, and, and so on. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it, it, you can, there are people out there who, are, who, who aren't necessarily very good at what they do, or even who are straight up scammers. It's very, it's very, very tricky. Um, if there's a way to make a, a marketplace work in a, in a way that um, yeah, then I think that could be really useful to the ecosystem. Um, Absolutely. Uh, reduce the friction, make discovery available, keep it outcome-based, um, things, things like that. Hooking yeah. things up with GitHub accounts so people and sort of portfolios of work that are, can be verified or authenticated somehow. Like, I think there could be, like, there could be a huge, huge opportunity there. Duly noted on our end. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you, thank you so much for these uh, insights here. A uh, little quick uh, change of pace. You are quite active online on Twitter. Or com. Uh, I wonder if uh, you could share a little bit about how you have experienced it, how it has helped the project. Uh, any advice for people that are not too active, and then maybe if there's some people you really like following that you might like to give a shout out to. Um, I mean, I don't know um, that many people wouldn't already be following him, but I would certainly <laughs> recommend Anthony Fu. He is certainly well, uh, inspiring to follow um, because you can just see the pace at which he creates uh, projects. Um, 
which is fantastic. Um, I would recommend, who else would I recommend? Um, if you like a dose of positivity in your, um, in your feed, follow um, uh, Scott Hanselman. Um, he's not in the, the view community, but he is an invariably positive voice on Twitter. Um, has a lot of interesting things he he's he's up to. Um, I've been. Um, I would also, by the way, uh, it depends a little bit on you know the kinds of things you're you're interested in. So um, I would highly recommend uh, if you're interested in TypeScript performance, you could follow mm -hmm. uh, Alexandra says Alexandra Shikara. She's very good on sort of. Giving you giving you some some tips and understanding how things work there. Um, I would also say that what would I recommend? There's so there's so many interesting folk to. Right. to Maybe some of them makes you laugh. I don't know, but but yeah, I'll get you mentioned a bunch. Follow <laughs> um, uh, Debbie O'Brien. Uh, she's great. She's on the the um, playwright core team, um, and uh, and uh, I think representing them as a. A developer advocate. She's pretty busy right now. I think her baby, baby, she's got twins. And they were just born in December. Um, <laughs> but she is, she is an invariable voice of uh, warmth and definitely will make you laugh with some of the jokes. So <laughs> definitely follow her. I don't know. There's, there's lots of folk. Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you oftentimes uh, get together with people in person in the context of conferences or other meetups? Uh, are things planned maybe for this year? Yeah, I, absolutely. So um, I'm I'm an extrovert at heart. So I I love um, I love it when I can meet people, and uh, particularly if they're people I've collaborated with or know from GitHub issues or Discord or something. So I am I'm totally in um, in for that, and that's one of the main reasons why I go to conferences. Uh, so I just because you know otherwise you can you can. Working from home is great. I love it, and I really would not want to change it. But at the same time, the thing that you really lack is connections with like, personal connection with people. Um, I've I've even apart from conferences, I've even gone to uh, Paris, Amsterdam, just to meet up with people on the team, um, and actually just spend a couple of days and uh, do some co working and so on. And it's totally worth it. Um, so. Absolutely. I try try and go to about a conference every month. That's my, my aim. Um, and so there, I've got a few already booked in for, for 2024. Yeah, Maybe we can meet up at one of those conferences. The, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, there's a lot going on in Europe. So yeah, yeah hopefully soon. Um, before we proceed to the demo of Next, are there any um, last things you might like to mention to people, advice? People getting started with open source or to other maintainers. Um, any any final notes and remarks? Um, uh, well, do um, if you if you would fancy it. Um, I uh, stream often on Twitch and um, just random stuff, uh, coding, fixing bugs, creating new projects. Um, so that might be worth uh, mentioning um, if, you, if you if you want to. I also have a YouTube channel where I post the. the past streams if if feel feel no pressure it doesn't work for everyone but i i really enjoy it and i i enjoy um being able to chat to people as i code uh, as i said i'm an extrovert <laughs> so it, it works really well um for me so do feel free to, to, to join me if you ever want and i should say alex uh, lichter is putting out some phenomenal youtube videos on nuxt and how things work internally they are really great his thumbnail game is excellent um, and obviously, he's on the core team, so he knows who he's talking about. Um, and that's that. So definitely check that out. Um, Thank you so much for the interview so far. And uh, whenever you're ready, we could transition to a demo. Sure. Great. Okay. Let me fire up an editor. So code next app. And I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. One more speak. Precisely, I will share my window. Okay, this is a new Nux application. Is that coming through clearly for you? Mm -hmm. Great. So I've just run um, Nuxy in it, um, and it's created this this folder which has got um, sort of the bare bones 
Uh, and actually, most of the stuff here is just uh, infrastructure. The only code we have is app.view. I'll start the dev server, which powers most of what Nux does in the background. Um, so Nux has, has got a lot, does a lot of things under the hood for you. Uh, so for example, you'll see that uh, I have this component, which is made available just as a welcome component. I'll open this in uh, the browser. So you can see the, uh, the, um, the welcome component renders this, this thing. Um, and, and you can also see that it has some props, so you can actually change some things about this and you get uh, type safe access uh, to that. So uh, I think it looks like there's this star GitHub prop, which we could say um, star us, something like that. And that will change some text somewhere in, in here. I'm not quite sure where it is. Uh, but if you were to pass an invalid uh, prop, that would throw you an arrow. So Nux has stuff like that um, built in. Um, and you can you could you could do the the same if you created your own component. We could do something like test me, uh, create a test component. Uh, hi there. And if we go back uh, and use that test component, we could well one uh, your editor knows that it exists, um, and when you put it in, it sort of immediately works. So Nuxt will automatically import that component only where it's used in your app. So it's bundle split out if it, if it needs to be. Um, and then you also get stuff like uh, define props. Uh, and we'll say this one has a prop of message. Um, that is then going to be, oh, and if I say maybe required true, then I'm actually going to need to supply it at this point, or I'll get an error in the message. And we could actually view compiler is expecting a comma. That makes sense. Um, and we should also see that this is typed for us and, uh, and so on. So you get a lot of um, sort of good developer experience stuff out of the box. Uh, the same goes with um, view composables. So a lot about Nuxt, um, we've really leaned into the move from view two to view three, um, which was basically moving from everything being built in, to having a sort of composable logic concept. So you could pull in what you're needing only when you need it. Um, and so, uh, so we do that with not just the, the client side or the Nux built-in utilities, but also your own code. So you could do something like um, uh, use my stuff. Uh, and you, you could create your own composable, do some logic, um, return something. Uh, and then again, you can use that um, easily um, in, your, in your app. So you could just do something like use my stuff. Um, and so that will be typed uh, and available to you. So it knows, for example, what it, how it, what it comes back. Um, so you get this really nice sort of all the way through end to end um, process of what is hopefully quite a clean approach rather than needing to put all the imports. But um, TypeScript and your editor know where they're all located. So when you refactor things, things work. Or when you click through, stuff works. We also have this Nitro server, um, which is mm -hmm. um, which uh, like like Nux uses file-based routing. So you can do stuff like um, we'll call it foo. We could create an API endpoint, um, and again we could return something, some value, um, and you can actually access that uh, with with a this dollar sign fetch utility, which will actually be type hinted for you, so you you can fetch that. So we could actually just display it here. Um, and that's going to be the data that the server endpoint returns. In fact, in the server rendering lifecycle, when you're doing fetches to your own API, um, we don't mm -hmm. even hit the network layer. We'll just make an internal um, request uh, and it will emulate the network layer, which basically makes this possible to be incredibly fast, um, at which is built for serverless because we Again, every time you would hit the network layer with serverless, you would have to potentially invoke a new uh, instance of your, your Lambda. So we, we can just avoid that entirely. Um, and we can even, uh, we even supply view composables that do stuff like um, prevent refetching on the client so that there's a, a, a cache. So when this data is fetched, we're able to fetch it only on the server and not refetch it on the client, um, which is 
pretty useful and and we can we can mm -hmm. you know pass lots of other there's lots of other um, request handlers and, and other utilities that you can do there so that's that's pretty pretty nice i think um next has always had the concept of uh of, com of plugins so code that runs when your server starts so you could do something like um you could have an auth plugin for example um, and you can um you can inject uh, like a, a global singleton um and you could you could maybe do uh, have your auth user and have a login function or something like that uh, and when you do that you then can access it with uh use next app auth um, and you would then be able to, do, you know, again, do the same kind of, of stuff um, where you basically are able to uh, handle things that are in that plugin. We provide um, callbacks. So you could do something like on Nuxt ready. So once everything is all loaded and your app is interactive, then we're going to load a third party uh, script. Uh, we provide sort of, obviously, Nuxt is uh, server side rendered. So you mm -hmm. can do things like, uh, use SEO meta and just put some stuff in like a title and description. Uh, and that will, um, it's a pretty easy way of interacting with things. Uh, you can have, uh, layouts and, uh, root middleware, and you can have, uh, your own modules that integrate with, with Nux. Uh, there's there's lots and lots and lots of stuff, but I, I'm just I'm just talking. What what's interesting to you? What what else should I show you? What 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 does it not do? <laughs> what does it not do? Well, we try we try to uh, to make it. I I mean I would I would um I would use Nux personally in almost any situation, even even if you don't need a uh, view. Um, we actually have lots of experimental features. Uh, mm -hmm. we can even turn off, for example, um. What is it? Oh, I think this might now be in features. You can even turn off um, scripts entirely and have a purely HTML rendered app at the other end. Um, mm. And that that's, uh, that's interesting. How would you describe the, the learning curve of, of Nux? And I mean, it, it looks not scary at all now that you're walking us through it. Uh, but for for you know junior engineer, someone maybe you know in college, going out of it, a uh, beginner, uh, how what are you hearing from people in terms of their first experience with Next? So I'm hearing. I mean, I think I'm hearing. I I I'm always happy when I hear both positive and negative stuff. I mostly hear positive stuff. Obviously, there's a danger of self selection there. That <laughs> um, the things that people tell me. Tend to be more positive. Um, I hear different different things based on whether people use Nux two or not, because I think a lot of the things about View three um, that uh, that are I think good decisions. People also might not like uh, if they are coming from View two. So sometimes there's a difference based on that. Um, and if you if your first experience is with Nux three, then you know, things will be more. Uh, intuitive than if you are coming from a different way of using Nux in in Nux two. Um, generally speaking, the feedback is really positive, and I'm really really happy if people give me feedback that isn't. Um, but the very best way, of course, is when people don't just give feedback on is this good or not, but when they become part of a solution, so they have an idea for improving it or thinking through an API that might might uh, be a, a better or, or or even just take responsibility for it. Um, there, there are obviously, there are sometimes, you know, people who come in as sort of, uh, with ultimatums that are, okay, if you don't change mm -hmm. this, I won't use the project. <laughs> that's not a great way to, to interact because I mean, the whole thing that's motivating me and most other maintainers is that we want to help people and we want to create a project that people like to use. Um, and it's like, you're sort of going like directly for the, the jugular, you know, like, yeah. yes. You know, you thought you thought you did something good. I'm going to tell you it's terrible. Unless you change it, I won't. I'm going to reject you. Like that's that's a very sort of. I think if you don't realize that open source is a very personal thing, and that that you know it's a very, very emotive. Like one of the reasons people burn out in open source is because they pour so much of themselves into it because they, it's it's very much of them. 
So when you reject a project, it can come across very much like you're rejecting a person. And it can be really tough. Like, I know my dinners who've had trouble, you know, going to bed at night because it's what something someone said, which I know others who are much better able to put barriers in place. But, you know, I don't know. I would, I would just always be very, very careful, even if I don't like a project, not to say something negative about it. Because I'm not just saying something that, oh, I mean, criticism is fair, but, um, but like, think about how you criticize because it, it can really stay with someone because it's not like it's their job. It's not like they finished their work at 5 p.m. They left the project behind. This is the project that they come home to and that they work on in the evenings and on the weekend because they care. I don't know. I just think. You think very carefully before you criticize someone's baby. And uh, I think open source projects are. Absolutely. Of course, you know, when it comes to the internet, hope for the best, expect the worst. But I mean, yeah. certainly you're, you're absolutely right here. Thank, thank you for, for highlighting this. And uh, yeah, folks, take it easy. Trying. <laughs> People are trying their best here. Um, but yes, absolutely. Uh, do you think it would make sense for a closer to maybe also show the website or the GitHub repo story? And for folks to Absolutely. get started, then, yeah. Um, I will fire up my uh, screen again. Uh, Nuxt website um, is uh, nuxt.com. So you can, you can check it out. Um, there's lot, lots of stuff there. So um, see there's the sort of marketing front end that explains a little bit about what it does. Um, you can also go into the docs. The, the, all this content is directly from the framework repository and see how you would get going. Um, what the steps would be, and a little bit about the background. Um, there's also more stuff in terms of uh, the next modules list. Um, so this actually has all of the modules that I was talking about, and you can filter and look through those. It's just quite, quite a handy guide. Um, you can see a little bit more also about the deployment providers we support. Again, most of these, many of these will be zero config, and it's not an exhaustive list. Um, the whole aim is that we want to support lots and lots of features in a um, cross-platform compatible way, so no lock-in. As far as we're concerned, that's a very, very high value. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some more stuff that you can, you can have a look at. Uh, so yes, check out Nuxt at Nuxt.com. We also have a, obviously our GitHub repo is uh, github.com uh, forward slash Nuxt, Nuxt. And that is, uh, that is something that you could check out as well. Um, there are some issues, a few of them. Uh, quite a lot of these are for Nux 2 rather than Nux 3, but we do have plenty of Nux 3 issues as well. If you want to get stuck in, um, you can pick some of those. Um, if you're interested in contributing to Nux, I actually have uh, mm -hmm. a blog article on how you might get started, um, uh, including some links to um, issue searches that you could have a look at in terms of what you might be interested in doing. And I will also say that if you want to, um, I have a, an open calendar invite. You can book any time, 10 minutes with me. Um, if you want to get involved um, in Nuxt or in open source, I would always be happy to, to chat and help if I can. Um, particularly if, if you feel like, you know, there's something in your background or a past or whatever that might hold you back, I really wouldn't want that to be the case. So um, I'd be really glad to talk to you about it. 